Well, good morning. It's Bruce Williams again, and I'm going to do part six of a selected gross pathology of mice and rats. And we're going to cover in this lecture the gastrointestinal system of the rat. Before we start, as I do with all my lectures, I want to thank those friends and colleagues who've not only provided me their images over the years, but have shaped this field and do a far better job at it than I do. I salute all of you. Okay. Let's start with the gastrointestinal tube, and I usually go from front to back. Here's a case of malocclusion in a rat. We also talked about this uh, in the mouse. We'll talk about it with guinea pigs and hamsters and gerbils and rabbits. And malocclusion is a, a common problem in rodents because the incisor teeth of rodents grow continuously throughout their lives. The optimal occlusion of the incisors is a requirement for a balance between their rapid growth and their normal rate of attrition. You know, there's always a little bit of malocclusion in, in rodents, so they keep their, uh, <coughs> so the teeth wear on each other. They call that class one malocclusion. Class two malocclusions are overbites, class three malocclusions are underbites, and uh, malocclusion of type two or type three uh, reaches an incidence of about 1% in two-year-old Wistar rats, which were studied. Um, it's considered to result from a variety of hereditary and environmental causes, and possibly may have something to do with the diet uh, on top of all of that. We'll take a good look at this picture. If you nailed the uh, diagnosis, good for you. This one is pretty tricky. Great picture from uh, Charlie Clifford in a rat, and the signs of this particular condition in this particular individual are very subtle. There's a small amount of porphyrin staining at the uh, uh, medial canthus of the eye. And if you look closely, you'll see some swelling in the area of the salivary glands. We're going to talk about a high morbidity, low mortality uh, disease um, called sialodacryoadenitis. Um, caused by a coronavirus. We've already talked about Parker's rat coronavirus, which causes a mild lower respiratory infection. This is one that attacks, as the name would say, Sialodacryo, uh, would attack the salivary glands and the lacrimal glands. Um, <clears throat> rats, like mice, have a large horseshoe-shaped gland behind the eye. It's a large lacrimal gland uh, called the hardarian gland and, hard, and damage to the hardarian gland will accompany damage to the salivary glands. There is marked necrosis and edema which is uh, often centered on the ducts. You can get a little bit of a pulmonary infection, <clears throat> this, this particular coronavirus uh, in some circles does cause pneumonia and as you would expect immunodeficient animals would have the most severe lesions. Here's one, uh, another animal that shows more profound swelling in the area of the salivary glands. It attacks all of the salivary glands that are serous. It does not like the uh, uh, the mucous salivary glands, like the sublingual salivary glands. Here is uh, an animal that shows uh, via incision the swelling the hemorrhage and necrosis affecting the salivary glands. Um, initially, you will see hemorrhage and necrosis and the swelling like we see here. And then over time, because this doesn't kill a lot of animals, um, if the animal survives, if you take uh, sequential biopsies, you will see some really bizarre looking, uh, uh, a really bizarre looking lesion of uh, squamous metaplasia of the ducts and ultimately these cells will differentiate in back into the salivary gland tissue to reconstitute the gland but in between you get these really odd looking forms somebody call some people call it sialomyometaplasia or sialometaplasia and it can look very bizarre almost like neoplasia the virus is, of course, transmitted by infected uh, saliva and nasal secretions and often is subclinical. And I've shown you some very mild lesions that uh, uh, keepers may not pick up on. You can also see uh, damage to uh, olfactory epithelium. That's that sort of um, desire for coronaviruses to affect the respiratory tract. 
and uh, this may uh, this damage within the uh, olfactory epithelium may affect pheromone detection and therefore uh, affect reproduction in rats. Okay, moving a little further down the GI tract. Um, this is a rat pup, and the stomach and the duodenum are full of undigested milk. And we talked about uh, a couple of viruses in mice that will affect the uh, uh, respiratory tract. The coronavirus that we see in mice uh, does not affect rats. The coronaviruses, as we've seen, affect the uh, uh, salivary gland, the lacrimal glands, and often affect the upper and lower respiratory tracts, but they don't really have a good one that affects the GI tract. But they still have a rotavirus. Now, rotaviruses generally affect very young animals. They cause necrosis of the cells of the villar tips, and so the villar tips will shrink down, leaving the animal with uh, significantly less uh, absorptive area as well as the villi are denuded of the uh, enterocytes which contain enzymes needed to digest uh, complex carbohydrates like lactose. So this milk is sort of going to stay there and it's going to curdle. There's usually uh, histologically very little uh, hemorrhage or inflammation and uh, the syncytia that's seen in the enterocytes is, is pathognomonic for this lesion in rats. Grossly, um, Enterococcus fecium durans can result in a, a very similar picture, but the histo lesion is very uh, different with the presence of the bacilli adherent to the enterocytes, and there's no villar blunting with enterococcal infections. The classic name for this condition uh, of rotavirus in rats is infectious diarrhea of infant rats, or IDER. Remember the rotavirus of, uh, of mice is enzootic diarrhea of infant mice. Uh, rotaviruses very classically just affect young animals, we said, uh, to less than two weeks of age, and the disease that it causes in adults is, is asymptomatic. Here's a rat with a a tremendous gastric adenocarcinoma. Uh, these uh, classically have been uh, have been caused by the administration of carcinogenic compounds, including MNNG, and rarely duodenal reflux has been uh, uh, incriminated. But usually, this is due to uh, manipulation uh, by scientists for the per sole purpose of causing these large gastric tumors. Here's a rat with a, a very large intestine, uh, and this could be the result of two. We talked about this uh, when we talked about rats. Um, one of these, one of the potential causes for this would be administration of intraperitoneal uh, anesthetics. Uh, years ago, it was chloral hydrate, then became sodium pentobarbital. Uh, now it's avertin, but when you inject them into the abdomen, you run the risk of irritating the, uh, the serosa of the gut and causing a severe adynamic ileus. That would be my first thought. My second thought would be that uh, this is megaloileitis due to infection by Clostridium piliforme. Hopefully, we would see areas of necrosis and might see some foci of necrosis in the liver, as we'll talk about in just a minute. And it won't be too long before we talk about it, because now we're going to move into the liver and pancreas of rats, and I don't even think I have a slide of pancreatic disease in the rat. But here's a very nice uh, picture of a liver with miliary necrotizing hepatitis. And this is a picture that is very classic in a number of animal species for gram-negative sepsis. Little white multifocal to coalescing dit dots scattered through all of the lobes of the liver. Um, some are very big, well, none are very big, but some are bigger than others, suggesting a temporal uh, difference between the two. 
and this is strongly suggestive of gram negative sepsis. In any species, when we think about gram negative sepsis in mice and rats, first thing I'm going to think about is going to be hot gram negative, primarily salmonella. Remember that in mice and rats, uh, salmonella is primarily a septicemic disease rather than the classic necrotizing enteritis that we see in other species. So initially, when the salmonella gets into the portal system and goes to the liver, you are going to see areas of necrosis as the body is is uh, successful in eradicating the bacteria, but in doing so liberates the endotoxin, which is a component of the bacterial cell wall. And this damages endothelium and results in little spots of necrosis throughout the entire liver. If you euthanize the animal at that time, you're going to see multifocal paddock necrosis. Um, if the animal survives, um, as the body cleans up these areas of necrosis, the first cells on the scene are neutrophils, and they will shortly be, be followed by macrophages. And then several days down the road, your uh, autopsy specimen from the liver will be multifocal uh, nodules throughout the liver of macrophages. And these have classically been called paratyphoid nodules, I guess similar to what is seen with typhoid uh, in people. And just remember that that is a later stage in the cleanup of an animal who is probably successful in combating Salmonella septicemia. Uh, any gram negative could do something like this. A uh, Yersinia certainly could do that. And then finally, we're going to think about another gram negative Clostridioides piliformi with the causative agent of Tizer's disease. And when we look at Tizer's disease, um, rodents. Uh, very commonly have Clostridioides piliformi as a uh, as a normal commensal in their GI tract and it usually causes no problem but eventually it may get uh, irritated or may start to proliferate as a result of a change in the bacterial flora of the gut and it will uh, invade the uh, wall primarily of the colon and liberate exotoxins in the form of perforins that will cause necrosis. The bacteria will get into the portal circulation and they will shoot into the liver where they are just as happy to continue to liberate their toxins and cause necrosis. If the animal does not succumb to at that stage the infection, then it will move into the heart and it's very happy to cause myocardial necrosis and very few animals will survive that. Unlike other clostridial species, Clostridioides piliformi is an obligate intracellular pathogen, which has made research over the years a little more difficult and will consistently stain gram-negative as most of the other Clostridia or all of the other Clostridia stain gram-positive. This liver is filled with cystus cerci. Um, the cysto doctors have decided that they're going to have a uh, uh, different names for the larval form of a cystode and the adult form of a cystode in the uh, in the natural host, which makes it very difficult for uh, us poor pathologists who have to memorize all these names. Um, in this particular case, the definitive host is a cat and in the cat it's an, a regular tapeworm in the gut it's called tinea tinea formis um, in the the larval form which is often seen within the liver or on the serosa or within the mesentery or omentum goes by a couple of names cystocircus fascialaris and cystocircus tinea formis and it's somewhat unusual in rats because it has been associated, although never proven, to give rise to sarcomas in the liver. Sarcomas are a very unusual uh, neoplasm of the liver to start with. But if you look at it in the textbooks, it's been associated with hepatic sarcomas, so do remember that the cystocircus fascialaris in the rat is considered one of the oncogenic uh, infectious agents. If you see it in the colony, it means that there's been a cat around and, and the rats have ingested uh, the infected feces, which probably has gotten some, somewhere into the food supply. So not a good 
thing to see in your uh, in your colony. And then we'll finish up with uh, a tumor in the liver of a rat, and and it's very difficult to say exactly what you're looking at um, on a gross specimen. The fact that we have multiple tumors suggests the possibility of uh, uh, of a metastatic neoplasm. Um, other possibilities in this particular case in the rat will be histiocytic sarcoma, commonly hitting the liver, and I would probably go straight to the kidney to see if I saw the characteristic uh, droplets within proximal tubular epithelial cells of the lysozyme that these tumors secrete, and they often have a lot of EMH in and around them. This could be lymphoma. Rats like uh, mice are very susceptible to lymphoma. It could be those fibrous sarcomas we talked about um, in association with cestodes. And then if we want to look at a couple of, of non, uh, non-neoplastic conditions, I would never rule out the possibility of Coronabacterium cuchari abscesses because every rat carries them. If you immunosuppress them, they can manifest. And then Klebsiella pneumonia, Pseudomonas, anything like that could cause a similar appearance. Okay, well, that's the gastrointestinal system of the rat. I think in our next, next lecture, we're going to uh, cover the remaining, uh, the remaining systems, including the integumentary system, the urinary system, uh, the nervous system and the reproductive system and draw an end to this uh, particular lecture series. I hope that you've enjoyed it. hope you will continue to come back to the, to the Foundation's Facebook page, and I hope everybody has a great day.